Hi everyone. Good morning here. Um, today we're going to start on chapter nine, uh, do a systematic way of introducing or classifying uh, chemical reactions. Uh, in this chapter, not only we're going to discuss, like I said, the types of chemical reactions, and then we're going to introduce uh, factors affecting uh, chemical reaction, especially the rate of chemical reaction. And then we're going to talk about the heat energy involved in the reaction and also uh, why there's a reaction and what happened and how, how can we explain the heat and also reactions of rate of the reactions. That's the second part of this chapter. And finally, in the last part of the chapter, we're going to talk about uh, chemical equilibrium. Uh, basically, what happened is reversible reactions, and uh, what happens is both forward and bad, and the reverse reaction both have the same reaction rate, and also factors that can affect chemical equilibrium. So mainly we divide that this chapter into three parts, but I hope we can cover that in, in two lectures. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, we have two ways of classifying chemical reactions, uh, talking about the types. Uh, one type is the big, called the basic five basic types. Okay, they're based on the uh, fashion of the reaction or based on the, the uh, chemical equations. You can recognize these five types based on chemical equations. They're called five basic types. And these five basic type types include combination reaction, uh, decomposition reaction, single displacement, double displacement, or combustion reaction, okay? And, and of course, these five basic types, I guarantee you when you see the chemical reaction or examples of these chemical equations, you will understand why they're called, for example, combination or decomposition. So let's take a look. The first type, uh, combination reaction, see that basically is uh, two or more substances and, and combine and resulting a single product. A resulting single product. That's why combination reaction. So the, the following two examples are examples of combination reaction. You can see that calcium react with, with sulfur, you get a calcium sulfide or sulfur dioxide and water, you get a sulfurous acid. See that just both uh, cases. The first one tells you two elements combine to give a compound or the second case is two compounds combine to give a, another compound. But the bottom line is, if we have a combination reaction, the product has to be a compound because you're talking about combining substances, okay? The next type is kind of like the opposite way of combination called decomposition. Uh, that is from a single compound. Okay? It has to be a compound that decomposes to give you uh, two or more substances. And these simpler substances can either be compound or element. There's no... A certain way of doing that. But we know the starting material, the reactant has to be a compound. So we can see that the, the following two examples are both involving decomposition reaction. The first one is copper two oxide decompose, decomposes to give you two, the constitutional element, copper and oxygen. The second one is a uh, a potassium chlorate decomposes to give you potassium chloride and also oxygen element. So both reactions is from a compound decomposes to give you simpler substances. Okay, the third reaction is also very unique called single replacement or single displacement. I have seen both ways. Um, that is a element displaces another element from its compound. Okay, you can see that I know it's kind of like weird. An element displaces a, another element in a compound. That means you can see in this case is kind of X displaces Y out of its compound. So end up with a Y as an element and then X gets into the compound. Again, X, the element replaces Y from the compound. So Y becomes an element that's why displaced. And then X gets into the compound. Okay, that's what displacement reaction is. And you can notice that, of course, the most characteristic characteristics of recognizing a single displacement reaction is both the reactant and product must contain a element and a compound, right? X at Y Z or Y X Z. 
So an element and a compound, that is a diverse typical way of recognizing a single displacement reaction. At the bottom two are examples. And the first one is iron element displaces copper. So you can get copper element. The second example is iron element displaces hydrogen. You can see the hydrogen element. You see that, of course, iron in both cases enters the compound, uh, enters to combine with sulfate, end up with copper to sulfate. So those are examples of single displacement reaction, or sometimes people call it a displacement reaction. Okay, the second, uh, another, a fourth type is called a double displacement reaction, or sometimes called exchange reaction. Exchange by the word, you will see that it's basically two ionic compounds. Okay, two ionic compounds. You can see AX and BY. Okay, two ionic compounds. Remember ionic compound. If you don't forget, if you forgot about it, pause the video and go to chapter five. Okay, ionic compound. Basically, we have a positive ion, we have a negative ion, right? And the uh, ionic compound basically can be represented as AX and BY, right, positive, negative, positive, negative. Now you can see that after the reaction, basically they swapped, they exchanged. A was with X, after that A was with Y, and B was with Y, and after that B was with, and B is now with X. So AX, BY becomes AY, BX. Okay. Of course, the positive is still positive, it's just exchange the positive or negative swap. So this reaction is called a uh, double replacement reaction. Okay, you can see that the bottom two examples, Okay, silver nitrate, after that becomes silver chloride. You can see that the, the, the chlorine goes to silver. And uh, sodium chloride here becomes sodium nitrate. Okay, you can see it becomes sodium nitrate, kind of like exchanged the ions. Okay, similarly, uh, lead nitrate, okay, lead becomes lead iodide, and uh, potassium iodide becomes potassium nitrate. Okay, you can see potassium nitrate. They exchange the positive and negative ions. Of course, the most important thing for double replacement in the reaction, not only you understand they're swapping, but also write the correct formula for ionic compound. Okay, you can see that, or ANSO also balance the equation. Okay, you can see that there's a two here because the charge of lead is two. So when lead with iodide, lead becomes light two, lead two iodide, PBI2. Okay, again, those are something we learned before in chapter five about the formulas. So after you, you exchange, make sure you use that rule to write the correct formula of the product ionic compound. And then of course, with the correct formula, you can balance the equa equation correctly for double uh, replacement reaction. And the last basic type is called a combustion reaction. C combustion is basically a, a, a a, a formal word of burning. Okay, combustion basically means a fuel is okay, usually a compound, but a fuel, uh, usually a fuel, uh, uh, react with oxidizer. Okay, in most cases, the oxidizer is oxygen in the air. So you can see that react with oxygen in the air. And then the products, okay, the products depends on what element the fuel has is basically the element combined with oxygen to give you the product. Here, you can see the fuel contains carbon and hydrogen. So you end up with products, carbon dioxide and water because carbon hydrogen, when they combine with the oxygen in complete combustion, the final products are carbon dioxide and water. Again, depends on the, the type of elements that are present in the fuel, you may end up with different product, uh, but the products are all the similar because the product is the element of that fuel combining with oxygen in the air to give you the product. And that reaction is called a combustion. Of course, because it's a combustion reaction, sometimes uh, the reaction involves the evolution of heat and light, just flame, right? Because you're burning, right? So with that, uh, here are the five very simple way to understand the five basic types of reactions. Let's get some quick check. Hope you can uh, get a quick answer. Uh, this, this concept check showing a reaction of a compound decomposes to three uh, substances, simpler substances, uh, two compound and an element. We know that is an example of decomposition reaction. In the following three cases, I think uh, you can all understand 
them and based and based on those the, the, the characteristic of of each type i think you will be able to make a very easy and correct determination of the types just make sure uh be be careful or pay special attention to the third one what type is it is uh, based on this description of these types i'll leave it up to you and i think the key are noted in the notes okay very simple uh that is the five five basic types of chemical reaction and uh, like I said, there are other ways of classifying the reaction. The one way that is very useful, okay, very useful is called, uh, or when we use, well, when we classify our chemical reactions, instead of those five basic types, by classify the chemical reaction into two biggest categories based on how the reaction proceeds, how the reaction works. Okay, this way of classifying uh, has a broader scope and more useful because it's basically separate all chemical reaction into two big types. And that classification system is called either redox reaction or non-redox reaction. So basically we're classifying reaction into either redox or non-redox. Now, the, of course, redox or non-redox, uh, the difference is, is yes or no. So basically the, the rule of thumb is whether a chemical reaction involves the transfer of electrons. Okay, transfer electron from one substance for another, from reactant to another reactant. If it is involving the transfer of electron, uh, we call the reaction redox. If it is not involving the transfer of electrons, we call the reaction non-redox. Okay, non-redox. So the rule of thumb is whether there's a transfer of electron. Now, importantly, uh, before we move on, the word redox okay the word redox is not a like a real word it's a combination of two uh processes uh redox stands for oxidation and reduction okay oxidation reduction because later on we're going to study these two processes happen simultaneously that means without reduction there's no uh, no oxidation and vice versa so that's why these two processes always happen together that's why we create this word called redox reaction. Again, whether a reaction is redox, uh, we're talking about if there is a transfer of electrons, okay, transfer electrons. Of course, uh, sometimes when a reaction is given or when you look at a chemical equation, it's a kind of like a difficult, sometimes it's difficult to tell, hey, is there a, re a, is there a process that involves transferring of electrons or not? We Sometimes we cannot tell. So chemists, we created a simple number, a concept of managing these numbers, and that can help us to study redox reaction in a better way. And that number is called the oxidation number, or sometimes called oxidation state. Okay, oxidation state. And um, of course, that number is a number that again created by chemists assigned by uh, by chemists uh, to study the elements, okay, to study the elements in our chemical reactions. Uh, that number, uh, oxidation number, is basically uh, assigned in a way that we assume if, okay, if the charge, if a charge appears when the electrons, okay, when the electrons in, in each bond are assigned to the more electronegative element. Okay, that number is kind of like assigned, assuming electrons are all given to the more electron element and what charge these element will have. And that charge, we call it oxidation number. It's not real number. It's just, again, a number we assigned to the element, to the element that help us to determine or study redox reactions. Okay, I know it's still, uh, maybe complicated, but let's take a look at this very simple molecule, HCl. Okay, HCl as an example, and now I'll, I'll hope I can explain uh, oxidation or redox oxidation numbers from that example. We know HCl is a covalent compound. Okay, it has a polar covalent bound with chlorine being electron more negative, uh, hydrogen being electron uh, more less electron negative. So basically this polar bond we have a, sorry, let me redraw it. We have a partial negative charge on chlorine and we have a partial positive charge on hydrogen, right? We know because the bond is polar, uh, chlorine is more electronegative. So based on this compound, 
Okay, if we assume that bond of electron shared is all given to chlorine because chlorine is too elective. So if the, if the electrons of each bond are assigned to the more electronegative of the two elements, so given to all chlorine, then the chlorine will actually carry a negative charge, negative one, of course, and the hydrogen will carry a positive one charge because if they were given to chlorine, then that's the case. Again, those two charges are not real, but those two charges are called oxidation numbers. So if you ask me, what is the oxidation number of chlorine in HCl? Then the chlorine in HCl, the oxidation number is minus one and the oxidation number of, of hydrogen will be plus one. And assuming the electrons are all given to chlorine, again, not a real number. That's why we say uh, oxidation number is something we assign to this element so that we can study redox reaction. But of course, uh, we have very nice rules for us to assign. Okay, how do we assign the numbers? Okay, now this is just an explanation of what oxidation number is, but we have seven rules. I think we're gonna see right away of helping us to assign oxidation numbers. And after that, you don't have to worry about anything about giving the oxidation number. If I give you a compound element, anything, you can assign the numbers on yourself. Okay, so let's take a look. What are the rules of determining the oxidation numbers? Okay, the first rule, very easy. The oxidation number of an element, okay, of an element such as zinc, hydrogen, oxygen, silver, these are all elements, right? Some diatomic, some monoatomic, mono they're all element. If that's the case, the oxidation state or oxidation number is zero. The oxidation of an element, as you don't see an element, then the oxidation of the the oxidation number of the element is zero. Okay, very simple rule. Number two, uh, okay, oxidation number is zero for element. Number two, oxidation number of a ion, okay, real ion that means carry the charge. Okay, like a sodium plus ion or copper two plus ion. These ion with a charge, the oxidation number is the charge of the ion. Okay, plus one, then the oxidation number is plus one. Next plus two, the oxidation number is plus two. Okay, that means for ions, the oxidation number will be the charge. Of course, you need to keep the sign. The charge has a sign, okay? Uh, number three, the oxidation number for group 1A metal will be plus one in a compound. Okay, group 1A metal includes about lithium, uh, sodium, potassium, uh, uh, rubium, and, 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 and these alkaline metals, okay, these oxidation number, uh, cesium, these oxygen numbers is plus one in a compound, okay, such as in sodium oxide, you can see sodium hydroxide, the oxidation number for sodium is plus one because it is a compound and sodium is group one metal, okay, very similarly, the oxidation number for group two metal, alkaline earth metal, is plus two in a compound, such as magnesium oxide, the oxidation number for magnesium is plus two, okay, because magnesium is group two element, including beryllium, magnesium, calcium, sodium, barium, these elements, the oxidation number is plus two, which is the group number, okay? Number four, okay, number four, oxidation number for hydrogen in a compound or hydrogen containing compound, we should say, is mostly z plus one, okay? If you see a hydrogen in a compound, like water, like HCl, these compound, the oxidation number of hydrogen is plus one in most, most cases, okay? Except for metal hydride. It means if you have a metal with hydrogen, that's different, okay? We'll, we'll explain if I have an example on that. I don't wanna uh, give you too much info confusing these rules, but the rule here is the oxidation number for hydrogen in a hydrogen containing compound is mostly, okay, most, most cases plus one. That's the oxidation number for hydrogen. Okay, and the fifth rule is also similar to group uh, rule number four. The oxidation number for oxygen, the okay, oxygen in an oxygen containing compound, mostly, mostly is what? Is minus two. Okay, hydrogen is plus one, oxygen is plus uh, minus two. Okay, such as lean water, magnesium oxide, the oxygen number for oxygen is always minus two. Okay, except for peroxide, like O2 okay, together peroxide. It's, then it's not minus two. Again, if we have an example, 
we will go over with that. Uh, I'll explain to you, but again, the rule here is simply, I want, don't want to confuse you. Hydrogen plus one, oxygen minus two in most of the compound containing hydrogen or oxygen, respectively. Of course, uh, the rule number six, okay, rule number six, the oxidation number, okay, oxidation number uh, in a binary molecular compound, Okay, if we have a binary molecular compound such as HBr, if we don't know the oxygen number, the more electronegative element is assigned to a negative number equal to the charge of the element if it were a ionic compound. Okay, so if we for a binary molecular compound, the element with more electronegativity or greater electronegativity would carry a negative electron. Uh, oxidation number. And that negative number magnitude equal to the charge of that element, okay, if it, it were in the ionic compound. Okay, that's just kind of like a tricky way, which way it is. First, you need to know what the charge of the elements are. Okay, if you don't know the charge or forget about the charge, pause the video, go to chapter four. Again, okay, the chapter four, we talk about the charges of ionic compound, charge of the ions. We have a chart showing you the charges. Okay, so bromine, okay, bromine, for example, in this case, bromine, if it is an ionic compound, bromine charge it will be minus one. Okay, sodium bromide, potassium bromide, the charge of bromine is always minus one. So if that's the case in molecular compound HBr, even though it doesn't have a charge, but we still say the oxidation number of bromine is minus one because we assume it is inward ionic compound. The oxygen number equal to the charge of the element. Okay, bromine charge is minus one. So HBr, even though there's no charge, is a molecular compound, the oxidation number is minus one. Okay, minus one. And finally, number seven, you can see that I put the boldface letter, uh, meaning it's very, very useful. It's one of the most useful one. The first six you have probably have to memorize, but number seven is something you don't memorize. You use it a lot. Okay, as the most useful one. That is the sum of oxygen numbers in a compound. Sum means by adding all the oxygen number of the atoms together, you should equal to zero. If it is not a compound, if it is an ion, a polyatomic ion, then the sum of the, all the oxygen numbers of the element should equal to the charge. So it depends on whether your species you're talking about is neutral uh, or ion. If it is neutral, the sum of all together should be zero of all the atoms. If it's not neutral, the sum of the, all the oxygen numbers should be the charge of that species. Okay, for example, this one, sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Okay, that's the formula of sulfuric acid. No matter what that is, we know it is a molecule. So the sum of the oxygen number for hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen atoms, all of them, okay, all of them, those seven atoms, two hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, four oxygen, these seven atoms, the oxygen numbers sum all together should be zero. Okay, because one, some are positive, some are negative. So add them all together should be zero. Okay, it's very useful, one of the most useful. Okay, why it is useful? Uh, let's take a look. Okay, the same molecule H2SO4. Okay, same molecule H2SO4. We know uh, from this compound, we know it contains hydrogen, it contains oxygen. And if you remember rule number four and rule number five, you know in most compound, hydrogen is plus one, oxygen is minus two, right? If you look at look back, you can pause the video, look back or look back or your note. Hydrogen is plus one, oxygen is minus two. So in the compound, we already know hydrogen and oxygen. We assign the, the oxygen number rate, but we don't know sulfur. The question is asked you ask us to assign the oxygen number for sulfur. So what we're doing here is we know hydrogen and oxygen. And we also know some of all these together the oxygen numbers together should equal to zero. So we do a very simple mathematical calculation. Two hydrogen, two times one, plus sulfur, plus four oxygen, oxygen is minus two, right? Four times minus two. All these add together, positive and negative add to should equal to zero. Okay, should equal to zero. So the only thing you need to solve here is that sulfur, right? The other numbers, we know it, you move, four times minus two to the right becomes eight. You move two times one to the right, it becomes negative two, right? Move from left to right, right to left. So you can solve the number for sulfur is plus six, okay, plus six. Again, 
okay, I wanna, this is the first time we did it. So I wanna go over one more time. Uh, two times one stands for two of the hydrogen. Hydrogen is plus one. Okay, hydrogen is plus one. And four minus two is for oxygen. Oxygen is minus two. And plus the sulfur. Okay, all three adding together. Okay, all three adding together equal to zero. Okay, equal to zero. And then all you need, okay, all you need is to solve, okay, solve the number for sulfur. Okay, sulfur equals to eight minus two because you move the negative eight to the right becomes positive, which is again a simple uh, calculation. You will get, okay, you will get the oxidation number for sulfur. And that's why we said the, uh, the, the last rule is very, useful because it will help us to determine the oxidation number for the element that we don't know based on the rules using the one we know of. Okay, here is the more practice. I want to do a couple of the with you and I want you to do the rest of them again using real examples as a practice to memorizing the rules because again it's very hard to memorize them room one by one but if you use real practice and do them a few times you automatically put the rules in your mind. Okay, so the first case, let's do it together. We know potassium is a group 1A element. So the potassium oxidation number is one. Oxygen, we always know is minus two. So we don't know the number for chromium. That is why we need to solve it. So we solve it by two times one. Okay, oh, potassium is one plus two chromium, right? We don't know the chromium number plus seven oxygen. We know seven oxygen, oxygen is minus two. So adding all those together should equal to zero. Okay, equal to zero. And if you're good at math, you can move the seven times minus two to the right, move two times one to the right, you will get a two chromium. Minus one always happen. So uh, two chromium equals to uh, seven times two is 14 minus equals to 12. Okay, two times chromium equals to 12. Then each chromium is what? Is plus six. Okay, two chromium is 12. Each chromium is six. So that's how we solve chromium because we don't know. Uh, we don't know the oxygen number. We only know uh we only know oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, next, okay, next is carbon, carbonate ion. Okay, carbonate ion. I, this is another good example showing you how to use uh, how to use the rule number seven. Okay, uh, we know this is an ion, and we also know oxygen is minus two. Okay, rule number four and number four and five. Oxygen is minus two, so we don't know carbon. The same, we make a mathematical calculation carbon we don't know plus three oxygen oxygen is minus two so three times minus two equal to now here you don't equal to zero anymore because this is not a molecule in the previous example we have a molecule which equal to zero in the second example this is not a molecule this one is a polyatomic ion so it has a charge so that means if you add them all together instead of equal to zero it should equal to what? Equal to the charge of the ion, which is minus, why I always do that? Okay, which is minus two. So carbon, uh, I don't want to erase it, that's fine. Carbon plus three times oxygen equal to minus two. Again, this minus two is the charge of the ion. Of course, you solve it, okay, you solve it carbon, should equal to move that three times minus two to the right. So six minus two carbon equal to six. So the oxidation number for carbon is plus four. I'm sorry, six minus two is four. So carbon oxidation number is plus four. Okay, plus four. So, uh, and you also can see that for a good habit, after you know the oxidation number, you can mark that number on top of the element. Okay, because that will be again for useful. Keep that in mind. We do all these things oxygen oxygen numbers and everything is to help us to study redox reaction okay redox and that's why assigning something on the top of it 
will help you to hey look at straightly uh, straight when you really are working on the redox reaction. That's why you have a good habit. Put down the oxidation number on top of each element after you know them, because later on you will find that we need that number and especially the number change of these to see redox reactions. Okay, I'll leave the rest three for you to work on and practice the rules and the key should be in the note. Okay, next, after we know the oxidation number, let's get started, steady redox reaction. Okay, redox reaction. Like I said, redox reaction by definition is the transfer of redox. But sometimes we don't know if there is a transfer of electron process. That's why we assign these oxidation numbers to help us to determine the redox reaction. Because the oxidation number will help to tell us whether there is a transfer of electron. So if you take a look at this reaction, very simple, calcium react with chlorine to give you calcium chloride. Okay, we know before the reaction, calcium is an element, oxidation number is zero, number rule number one. Uh, before the reaction, chlorine oxidation number is zero because rule number one. Okay, after that, we know it will get a compound calcium chloride. The okay, calcium chloride, calcium in a compound, the oxidation number equal to the group number, which is group 2A. Remember, group 2A element, calcium group number is plus two. Uh, chlorine, okay, chlorine, the group number uh, is seven. Okay, group number is seven in a compound, especially in an ionic compound. Uh, chlorine, the group, the, 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 the oxidation number is minus one. Also, you can solve it uh, by adding all both together equal to zero. Okay, either way, you can you can determine the chlorine oxidation number is one minus one. So calcium is plus two, chlorine is minus one after the reaction in the product. So now you see that in the reaction of calcium, chlorine, and give chloride, the oxidation number actually changed for both element. Calcium, it actually what? Changed from zero to two. Uh, chlorine changed from zero to minus one. So if you have a reaction like that with a change or changes in oxidation number, that means this reaction has a transfer of electron process happened. And that's the case. This reaction is a redox reaction. You see, that's how we're using oxidation numbers. If there's a change of oxidation number, then there is a transfer of electron. And then there is a redox reaction. Okay, redox. It doesn't matter what changes, go up or go down. It has to be a change to imply a transfer of electron means redox reaction. Now, of course, Okay. The change again, like I said, can be go up, can go, can be going up or going down. So we have some terminologies of redox reaction describing a redox reaction. Okay, redox reaction. Like I said, the redox, this word, comes from a combination of two processes, oxidation and uh, and reduction. So during a redox reaction, there must be somebody or must be something happened via oxidation, and another one happens via reduction because it's these two processes always happen together. So we have some terminologies describing these processes based on, again, oxidation numbers. That's why we assign oxidation number, okay? The same process, like I shown here, uh, calcium chlorine becomes calcium and chloride with the oxidation number on the top. So you can see that visually. Okay, now calcium, okay, calcium oxidation number change from zero to two means oxidation number increase. Okay, from zero to two oxidation number increase. We call the process oxidation, okay, oxidation. When oxidation number increase means the losing of electron. Remember transfer means what somebody lose, somebody gains, right, okay, transfer. So when calcium oxidation number increase from zero to two increase, we call calcium undergoes the oxidation or calcium is oxidized and also means calcium loses electron. Okay, loses electron. In this case, lose two electrons. Okay, that's what oxidation means. Change of oxidation number by increasing it and losing electron. And meanwhile, calcium is called the reducing agent. Okay, whoever is oxidized will be reducing the others. So calcium is called the reducing agent. Okay. On the other hand, chlorine, the oxidation number changes from zero to minus one 
decreased, we call the reaction reduction process. And of course, chlorine will be gaining electrons so that oxidation number can, can, can decrease. And then chlorine, which is reduced, which undergoes reduction process is called the oxidizing agent because whoever is reduced is going to oxidize the other. They're like a vice versa. So again, calcium, increased number, oxidation, losing electron, the reducing agent. Chlorine, dropping or decrease oxygen number, gain electron, the oxidizing agent. Okay, calcium, of course, uh, chlorine is reduced. Okay, let's do one more time. Calcium, oxidation number increase, oxidation, losing electron, and that's called the reducing agent. Chlorine, decrease oxidation number, reduction, gaining electron, and that's called oxidizing agent. Okay, very important, these terminologies, because we have to uh, play with it a lot. Okay, so uh, with that, let's take a look at this reaction as, a, as an exercise. Okay, first, this reaction is a single displacement reaction, if you notice that, an element, a compound, an element, a compound. Copper basically kicks, uh, kicks silver out of its compound like a single displacement, okay, by the initiates, you, you see that. Now, of course, the first step is to label the oxidation number. Okay, copper is zero, silver is zero because they're both element, okay, both element. Now in the product, silver is plus one, okay, because silver is an ion in silver nitrate, the charge is plus one. Copper is plus two because copper is an ion in copper nitrate and the charge of this copper is plus two, okay, is plus two. So Basically, we label the oxidation number for these elements. And also you can label that too, but if you play with that uh, using the rules, you will find out NO3, the nitrate ion, the oxidation number doesn't change for anything. Okay, nitrate ion is still nitrate ion and no change in the oxidation number. So we actually don't need to mark the oxidation number from the nitrate because again, nitrate, you have nitrate NO3 before, it have nitrate after. So the nitrate ion itself actually doesn't even change during the reaction. Sometimes we call these ions a spectator ion. That means they're, they're looking at the reaction, but they're actually not involved in the reaction. So these are the important oxidation numbers we put on the, on the, on the, uh, on the element, then we can figure out what happened in the reaction. So for example, copper, the oxidation number from zero to two, increased so we know copper is oxidized right copper is oxidized means copper is the what is the reducing agent the answer is a i mean for the multiple choice purpose that's done okay copper increased oxidation number is oxidized whoever is oxidized will be the reducing agent okay if you want to see more if you want to answer more and kind of give you some self some some summary then if you can look at silver as well silver the oxidation number from one to zero decreased so silver is reduced. If silver is reduced, then that silver is oxidizing agent. Okay, it's oxidation agent. So that's what happened for the single uh, displacement reaction. And if you see more example, you can even pick a note here. Uh, all single uh, displacement reaction are redox reactions because single displacement involves the element of compound. So you're changing from zero to something else. If there's a change of oxidation number like this, it is definitely redox. So single displacement reaction are always redox reactions. Okay. Uh, next is uh, three examples of reactions. Okay, three reactions basically, and they ask you first. You have to determine whether these reactions are redox reactions. Okay, and then for redox reaction, you have to identify the oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Of course, you basic basic means you need to play with the oxidation numbers. Okay, these are the three reactions. I want to point out something to you. Again, you can practice. Okay, out of those three, the uh, first one and the third one are redox reaction. The second one, uh, I don't, uh, let me see. I don't believe is a redox reaction, but you can calculate. Okay, the second one, I don't believe is a redox reaction, but the third one and the fourth one are redox reaction, especially the first one. Like I said, we talk about single replacement, right? The first one is actually a single replacement reaction. Zinc element kicks uh, hydrogen out of the compound 
So you get a hydrogen element, see? Element, compound, element, compound. You have a single displacement and single displacement is always redox. So play with this redox reaction and see if you can figure out which is the oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Just keep in mind, oxidizing agent is the one that gets reduced. Reducing agent, that's the one gets oxidized. That's, that's the opposite. Okay, and I want to point out the third reaction. Okay, I want to work with you for the third reaction, basically. That is very special type of reaction. Uh, in order to, 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 to analyze the third reaction, like we said, we first start job is to put the oxidation state on these things. Okay, first copper one, a chloride. Co chloride is minus one, copper is plus one because it's plus minus, it's copper one chloride. So um, that's the oxidation number for the reactant. And in the compound, you can see that you get a copper metal, which is element. So the oxidation number is zero for that copper metal. And also you get a copper two chloride. So the oxidation number for this copper is plus two. Of course, chlorine is still minus one. Okay, why copper is two? Because you can see that in ionic compound, the copper of the charge of copper should be two now. Okay, because it's CuCl2. Okay, so the charge of the copper is plus two. So after that, you see that the oxidation number is marked. And if you look in the, look, this reaction is special, it is because the, the reactant has two copper, okay, two of copper chloride, copper one chloride. And two copper, one of them actually got oxidized, the other one gets reduced. Okay, if you balance, there are two coppers on the left and cool bottom on the right, right? One of the copper, the number increased from one to two. Another copper decreased from one to zero. So it's kind of like one to two and one to zero, two coppers. Okay, that's what happened for the reaction. This is a decomposition reaction, by the way. Uh, but this reaction is very unique because it's kind of get divergent, right? One copper increase oxidized, another copper decrease, re uh, reduced. But if you asked, there's only one reagent at the reactant. So basically the oxidation react and oxidizing agent and the reducing agent is the same thing because there's just two of them. One is get the oxidized reducing agent. One is reduced oxidizing, but the same compound basically serves both rule as oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Hope it makes sense. And that's something I want to point out. But again, use this practice. I should have the keys at the bottom to show you and, and to confirm if you did it right or not. Okay, and here is a third practice. Of course, I don't want to go over with you because you will most likely see this question as a bonus question in your quiz, okay, in your quiz of chapter nine. So uh, this is the reaction uh, happened in a brief analyzer. So basically, uh, uh, and the police officer check you if you have been drinking and, and driving. So uh, you, you, you get a get a breath out and, and the machine takes your breath and analyze uh, analyze the, the alcohol content content of your from your breath. And that reaction is of course a redox reaction. Your alcohol, the drinking is this guy and ethanol. So this what happened is the 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 reactant in the analyzer called a potassium chromate uh, dichromate react with alcohol, the ethanol to give you the product and that product is a color. So that's why they can, they can, they can determine whether you have been drinking or how much drinking it is. So now basically you need to analyze this reaction and determine, hey, which one is being oxidized, which one is reduced, which one's the oxidizing agent, which one is the reducing agent. So it's answered in the same way. This reaction looks complicated, but the hint is uh, please try to focus on carbon and hydrogen and also the chromine, these three elements and calculate their oxidation number and see what's changing. So that's the uh, quick hint. Okay, take a look at the oxidation number of chromium, hydrogen and carbon. See what is changing uh, before and after the reaction. So that's the reactant, this is the product. That's the reactant, that's the product. So this is what chromium becomes. Okay, this is what chromium becomes. This is what ethanol becomes. Okay, so these are the reactant product pairs. And then you can see, hey, calculate the hydrogen and carbon uh, oxidation number or calculate the chromium oxidation number on these two pairs and see if there's a change. And that's the hint to answer this question. All right, so that's the first part of chapter nine. Okay, like I said, we generally have three parts, but I want to finish this one. 
in, in this lecture as well. Uh, the first part, we talk about the types of reaction, okay, the types of reaction. Uh, the second part, okay, in the second part, I will keep talking about the reactions, but we're gonna explain to you uh, why there's a reaction, what happened in the reaction, and also some characteristic of a reaction. Okay, the first, let's get started. Okay, in order to explain a reaction, okay, chemical reaction, we have to, we have a summarized uh, three necessary rules or three necessary condition that to be satisfied uh, for a reaction to happen. And that three necessary conditions are summarized by some theories called a collision theory. Okay, it's a very simple summary, but this summary basically tells you what need to be satisfied in order for a reaction to happen and what are the necessary conditions need to be met. Okay, the first one, of course, is called a collision theory. So that means in order for the reaction to take place, okay, the reactant molecules, ions, or atoms have to in constant collision with each other. Okay, they're colliding with each other. Okay, these particles, the reactant, need to collide with each other in order for a reaction to happen. If they're not even in touch, there's no reaction. So the first necessary condition, okay, again, we're gonna explain our reactions using these conditions. Okay, but you have to know these conditions. The first condition is the reactant particles must collide with each other for a reaction to occur. The second condition, okay, second, which is a step above, that is, even though you have collision, the collision must have sufficient kinetic energy from these particles in order to result a chemical reaction. Okay, that kinetic energy is sufficient to result in reaction is called the activation energy. Okay, if they're colliding without the sufficient energy without overcome the activation energy, the reaction still doesn't occur. So you can see first condition is you have to collide, collision. And second is not only you need a collision, but also you need a sufficient energy so that the collision can overcome the activation energy for a reaction to occur. Okay, one step above. The third condition is even one more step on top of these. Not only you need to collide with sufficient energy, the orientation of these two molecules must be correct in order for a collision to happen. That means in order for some atoms to bind or something to bind together, to replace each other, whatever, the atoms, okay, the molecules must be pointing to each other correct in the correct, correct orientation in order for a reaction to be successful. Otherwise, even though you have sufficient energy, you may still not get a reaction. Okay, you must still get a reaction. So these three conditions must all be met in order for a reaction to happen. You can see it is actually very strict, not that easy for a reaction to happen. First, you need to have collision, constant collision. Number two, the collision when the molecules possess must possess enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy to have a reaction. And not only you need to have activation energy achieved, you need the orientation of the molecules to be correct when they collide. Okay, this picture shows you, hey, uh, in order for, for an NO2 and a CO to collide, to give a product, you can see that the molecules, when they collide, you have to have an oxygen and carbon facing each other to collide in order for the reactant, reactant to, be, to be products. Okay, basically in order for the carbon to take oxygen from NO2. Okay, that's the correct orientation. But the other ones, okay, other are correct, you can see other orientations, no matter if they're colliding with the potential energy, potential energy or kinetic energy, sufficient kinetic energy, the reaction still doesn't occur because the molecules are not properly oriented. Okay, so that's the picture demonstrates you how important it is for correct orientation. But again, these th three theories are basic theories for explaining uh, a reaction. How does a reaction occur? And also, we're going to use these three theories to explain factors that affect the rate of reaction. Okay, first you have to understand what the rate is. Okay, rate is basically like a speed. Okay, speed. How much reactants? How much reactants is consumed in a certain amount of time? How much products are produced? in a certain amount of time, just like how long you travel per hour, right? That's called the rate your speed. The speed of travel is what, how, how many miles you drive per hour. And the same thing is how much product we produce in a reaction or how much reactant we consume 
in a reaction. That's called a reaction speed, and we call it a reaction rate. Of course, these factors described here are the factors affecting reaction rate. And not only we're we going to study these factors, we're going to use those three theories, the three collision theories, to explain why these factors affecting reaction rate. So let's take a look at these factors first. I put in red, that means these factors are very important. Okay, telling you whether if you want a reaction faster or slow, how you can change these factors. Okay, the first factor is the physical nature of the reactants. Second factor is the reaction reactant concentrations. The third factor is the temperature of the reaction. The fourth factor is whether you can add a catalyst or not. Okay, again, don't worry, we're gonna explain each factor, but I wanna put you, these four factors are the ones that are affecting the rate of reactions. Okay, the first factor, that is the physical nature. Okay, physical nature mostly include the physical state of the reactant and also the size of the particles. Okay, these are what physical nature means. The physical state, solid, liquid, or gas, or the particle size of the, of the, of the reactants. Okay, regarding physical state, okay, if all the reactants are in the same physical state, here are some general rules regarding physical states. Reaction rates are faster for liquid state reactant than solid state. Okay, if you're a liquid state reactant, they are faster than solid state. The react rate will be the fastest when reactants are gas state, okay, gas state. Okay, so fastest rate is the gas state reactants followed by liquid state and slowest will be solid state. Why is that? Very simple based on the, based on the collision theory because when reactants are gas, the particles are separated, they're easy to, uh, to collide. And also because reactants are gas, they are free to move. Okay, when they're free to move, the particles free to move, they have greater chance to, uh, to collide. So collision is more frequent when reactants are in gas state. Okay, liquid state, the reactants mixed together can still in contact with each other, and even not that fast as gas, but they can still frequent in contact with each other. So the reaction rate is still faster than solid state. When you have a solid state, you can remember if a solid, only the surface particles may be in contact with another. Okay, the particles inside are not actually not in contact with the other. So there's no way they have frequent collision. So that's why gas state, most frequent collision liquid state followed by, and then the slowest will be solid state, okay, solid state. And if you do have a solid state reactant, okay, the reaction rate can be increased when you powderize the solid or increase the subdivision of the, so what, what do you mean subdivision? It means what? Change the solid into maybe smaller solid or small particles so that reaction can increase. Basically, is increase the surface area, right? Even though it's a solid, but you can increase the surface, making a fine powder, the reaction can still, um, reaction, can, you can still increase the reaction rate because you're getting the chance of more collision, more contact. Okay, here's a picture showing, um, to demonstrate the hazards of flammable powders, the scientists that spit this uh, spores, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like a powder, a flammable powder, over a candle, you can see the reaction happening in a very dramatic, and fast way because what? You have a powder, the reaction actually happens fast. Okay, more collision. Okay, next, okay, next is the concentration of reactants. Okay, the concentration of reactants basically mean higher concentration of reactants, faster the reaction rate. Because higher concentration means more molecules of the reactants, you have more collisions happen. Okay, so this, this picture demonstrating you uh, the concentration affecting reaction rate. Uh, you can see that the left picture showing burning the wood stick in the air. The flame is small. Okay, it's money. But uh, the second picture shows you insert that burning stick into pure oxygen. This is this bottle has pure oxygen. You can see this is happening. How big size? How bright the flame is in pure oxygen. Okay, this is in. Air. Air is like 20% oxygen, 21% oxygen. Here is pure oxygen. You can see the great difference between these two. And that happened is what? When you have pure oxygen, the concentration of pure oxygen is much higher than oxygen in the air, of course. So reaction happens faster in a more dramatic way. So increase in the concentration of reactant will cause in the increase of reaction rate because more collision. 
Okay, the third factor is temperature. Okay, third factor is temperature. Temperature affect the kinetic energy of molecules. If you remember that we studied that in chapter seven, I think chapter seven, we have five theories of molecular kinetic uh, uh, theory. Uh, temperature is the one that affecting the kinetic energy because higher temperature, the molecules will what will increase the 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 the, the movement rate, the rate of the rate, and their kinetic energy will increase. So we can see that chart at higher temperature. Okay, this red chart shows you the distribution of energy of the molecules energy uh, under higher temperature. Under higher temperature, more molecule will have a higher energy to overcome the activation energy, right? Low, when temperature is lower, like the, this chart, is, this is lower temperature, molecule energy, the, the distribution will be at lower side. When you have a higher and higher temperature, more molecule will be what? Will be having higher energy. Okay, remember, not every molecule has the same energy. So there's a distribution of energy for molecules. But when you have higher temperature, more molecules will be under higher temperature. Okay, we'll have, we have a bigger percentage of average kinetic energy, higher temperature, higher kinetic energy. So more molecule will have a chance to possess that enough kinetic energy, kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy. You can see this A stands for activation energy. Higher molecule, higher temperature, more molecule will be in that shaded area to overcome that activation energy means what? Greater chance of reaction. Okay, greater chance of energy. So in, in, in summary, higher temperature because the molecule wing average will have a higher average kinetic energy. So more collision will have potential or enough, potentially enough energy to overcome the activation energy. So from the point of view of activation energy, higher temperature, higher reaction rate. Reaction is faster. Okay, and finally, okay, finally, the last. Okay, the last uh, factor affecting reaction rate is adding a catalyst. First, we need to know what is a catalyst. Catalyst is a substance that can increase reaction rate. Remember, adding catalyst will actually increase the reaction rate. But in the end, catalyst will be reproduced. So catalyst is not really consumed in reaction. And all it does is basically increase the reaction rate, not being consumed. Okay, what it does, okay, what it does is a catalyst basically participate in the reaction. Okay, participate in the reaction. After its participation, the course of the reaction is changed to a different course, different pathway. And that different pathway, the activation energy is lower than before. Okay, you can see that this is reactants two together. Originally, they have the activation energy all the way to become products. But with the help of the catalyst, you can see that catalyst first bind with one of them and then bind them all together and then give you the product and we release the catalyst. But that alternative pathway showing down here, okay, showing down here, the activation energy, the barrier is much lower. And because of that, more molecule will have a chance to what? To overcome the activation energy. So catalyst does is to participate in the reaction lowering the activation energy by providing an alternative pathway. And that alternative pathway, because of lower reaction barrier, more molecules will have enough energy to surpass that barrier, to surpass that activation energy, to have higher reaction rate, to have fast reaction. But energy, but callus themselves are not, again, are not, <laughs> consumed, they can be reused, okay, they can be reused in our, okay, in our uh, following reactions. That's why you don't need a lot of uh, callous molecules. You get a small percentage of callous molecules so that uh, they can keep catalyzing the reaction, okay? And the final piece of the second part is talking about the energy aspect of uh, chemical reactions. Okay, basically the difference between, okay, basically the difference between the energy of the reactant and energy of the product determine the type of reactions energy-wise. Okay, you can see that on the left side of the chart, okay, on the left side of the chart, the product energy is lower than the reactant. Okay, this is the energy of the reactant over here. Okay, let me, let me erase it. 
Okay, this is the energy of the reactant over here. This is the energy level of the product over here. So that means what? The product in the end energy is lower. So what happened is from reactant product energy dropped. What happened it dropped is because some energy is released, getting out. Okay, when energy is getting out, the energy is going to what? Drop. That is why the reactant has higher energy than the product. When the reactant becomes product, the energy is going to decrease, drop. And because the energy drops, energy getting out, we call reaction like this exothermic reaction. Okay, exothermic means what? release energy. Okay, so that the product will have lower energy. Okay, release, just like your bank balance. You release money, your balance will be lower in the end. Okay, in the end, we call the reaction exothermic. Exothermic, release energy, the product energy will be lower. And on the right side, you can see that the reactor energy is lower, the product energy is higher. It means what? You absorb energy so energy can go up. So reacting to product, you get energy inside. So the energy goes up. If that's the case, we call the reaction endothermic reaction. Endothermic reaction means energy absorbed. So the reactant energy go up, the product energy will be higher. Just like your bank balance, your energy end balance will be higher if you put money in, if you absorb money in. So endothermic reaction, absorb energy, the product energy will be higher. So that's called the energy uh, type of different reactions. Okay, so that's all for the first two part of the chapter. I'm going to pause here, stop here, and I'll see you in part two, and we can discuss reversible reactions and chemical equilibrium. It will be a very relatively short part of chapter nine. Okay, hope you uh, enjoyed the first two parts. I'll see you part two of chapter nine.